We'll get started in just a couple minutes. We should have had Back to the Future on. It is the day. Uh, that is the one, yes. That is the one. Wow. I'm ready, yeah. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Chesapeake chapter of Incosi's third Wednesday dinner lecture. Tonight we're building 200 and would like to thank our sponsors, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Awesome, thank you. We have Amy Bays with us tonight. She'll be talking about human factors program at the Whiting School and specifically training in the system life cycle. And we also have a backup briefing that might follow if our other speaker arrives. Shows up, yes. Please be patient tonight. We're hoping for a good show and hoping for a good turnout. If you have any questions, please wait to the end and someone will have a microphone to bring around to you oh. to facilitate that. Okay. Either way, I it's a small room, small group. We are recording live over the web, so we want the questions. Micro yes, thank you. Okay. Amy, away you go. Okay, thank you. We're kind of we're kind of doing a song and dance tonight. I actually had another speaker that was supposed to be here and talk, and I threw this backup brief in just in case. And it turns out I'm going to have to. So, I've done this. I, I'm I'm a professional. Let's say. <laughs> Okay, go ahead and next slide. Uh, what I want to talk about, oh, next slide. I'm next slide. Never mind. Ignore me. Okay. Look at that. Um, my background is uh, my undergrad is in computer science. My uh, master's is a master of arts in education and instructional design and human performance improvement. So uh, what I want to talk about tonight is training and basically training in the system life cycle, but it's a different perspective to training. So training is uh, the application of uh, the science of learning and uh, human performance, and we use a lot of tools like uh, decision analysis, task analysis in the development of training. Well, not only do I have a, not have a speaker, we don't have a brief now <laughs> So the, the intent of training is to uh, improve the performance, to reduce the time and uh, increase the accuracy. <clears throat> but the question is, is training what's really needed? Oftentimes, um, people say, oh, we need to build training, we need to build training, and you go in there and you do an analysis of what the whole environment is, and you find out it's not really a training problem. Uh, I'll give you a really good, for instance, um, we, uh, a system was built and put out into the fleet and uh, they kept getting emails, you know, the system doesn't work, system doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Finally, they got an email from a Commodore that said, we shoved the thing in the corner and we stack stuff on it. And somebody went, we need to look at this. So they called me in and said, take a look at this. What kind of training do we need to build? to make the system usable. So I went down there and I took a look at it and I said, okay, show me how it works. Well, it was 22 steps to turn it on. Okay, problem number one. <laughs> so we started, the first thing we did, because we knew we were gonna end up having to do some redesign on the system, but we wanted to get it usable fast, is we created a job aid, you know, a little sign that gave you the 22 steps and we taped it to the side of the, the server rack, and at least the guys would turn it on then and play with it. So we got them going fast. It did end up being a lot of redesign of the system, and we did build a full-fledged training the way Navy builds training. 
And if you ever want to talk about how the Navy builds training, feel free to call me. We can commiserate. <laughs> so it's not pretty. But going back to this, the, the first question should all be, always be, is it really a training problem? And as I said, my master's degree was in human performance improvement. And what human performance improvement or human performance technology is, is actually looking at the problem and identifying the root cause of the problem. As I said, it's not always a training problem. But what you can do, you can uh, look at the problem, you can look at the gaps, identify where the gaps are, do some analysis as to why the gaps are there, do a uh, task analysis, a workflow analysis, those type of things. And then you can plan how to improve it. And you can develop interventions. They're called interventions. Sounds like, you know, <laughs> you sit them down and say, you know, we love you, but you're hurting the people you love. But it's not. But you, you design an intervention, and then you implement the intervention. And then, of course, you, you measure the intervention to see how well you're actually addressing the problem that you were originally called in to, to uh, handle. So a human performance improvement is a holistic approach to training. OK, so talking about interventions, inter interventions can be really simple. I mean, kind of like what I was talking about, where you write down the instructions and you tape them on the server rack. That would be considered an intervention. I wouldn't consider that an in-state goal, but at least it got, it got us over that little hump till we could redesign the system and make it usable. Interventions can include training, but they can also include other things. We'll look at that in a second. So this is uh, you know, the typical toolbox diagram, everybody uses a toolbox for their thing. But this just talks about the different, um, the different things that a human performance technologist can actually use. So you can look at things, uh, for instance, you can look at the, um, the human resources perspective. You know, is there incentive? Are the incentives appropriate to get the performance, to elicit the performance that you need, you know? Is there motivation if you visit the workplace and everybody hates their job and doesn't want to come in to work in the morning? Of course, they're not going to be performing to, you know, to the right standard. You can also build things like uh, decision support systems or, uh, sorry, not decision support systems, uh, performance support systems. So for instance, um, you could build a, uh, maybe a tablet app. You know, here's a good example. I was working with, uh, with an organization, <laughs> and uh, they had a UAV that they were trying to, uh, to train the guys how to use this. And part of the training for this UAV is the guys had to go through a flight crew uh, or a, a pre-flight inspection. So they had to go through <laughs> the, uh, the pre-flight to make sure that the, the system was ready uh, to fly. And if it wasn't, they had to know what kind of remediation they had to do in order to get it ready to fly. Well, some of the, some of the things that they had to do were very complex, and it was a technology that they weren't exposed to. So what we did is we actually uh, videotaped. We videotaped the training guy basically taking this thing apart and showing us all the weaknesses and showing us where things break. And we were, uh, we didn't actually get to build it, but the plan was to build a performance support system. So it would be a tablet, and we would have the flight checklist on the tablet, and if they hit something that wasn't, would fail the checklist, then you could click on the link and it would take you to the video for that specific system. So then you would know what to go into that system and fix. So that's an example of a performance support system. Um, Within the technology toolbox, there's also things like process engineering. You know, sometimes moving station one to station two and station two to station one in an assembly line makes all the difference in the world. So you have to look at those things. Workplace design, is the lighting right? Is the sound, you know, the, the acoustics right? Is the temperature right? So on and so forth to elicit the best performance. Okay, there's a lot of interventions here. Organizational, change in organizational culture, knowledge services. 
which would be like a knowledge management system. Um, we talked about job aids, automation also, just completely taking the human out of the system and automating the system. Uh, and ergonomics. Now, out of these interventions, do you have any idea which of those is the hardest to implement? Hmm? Motivation? No? Anybody else? The actual hardest one in there to implement is, whoa, oh, sorry. One more. Come back. There we go. The hardest one to implement is actually this one right here, a change in organizational culture. That is very difficult. In fact, um, this particular, the, the, um, the concentration that I'm going to talk to you about later is a, uh, an answer or a response to the desire to change an organizational culture. The human factors folks at APL were always irritated and angry because people would design a system and they would field the system and they would never think about the human factors. So they or we would get called in and say, it's not working, can you fix it? As opposed to saying, come be part of our project team at the start and we'll think about human factors from the start and build the system with the human in mind. Okay, we'll see. Right button, yay. So this is kind of how training would, this is just a, a top level example of how training would fit into the system life cycle. So at the critical needs, you would establish the existing state. You know, what's already What's already there? Is there already training built? Is it effective? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, then you would identify what can be leveraged. Now this, this can be a lot of things that can be leveraged. Um, one of the first things I do when I start uh, building training or a user guide or something is I ask for the test plan for the system. Because that test plan walks you how to do everything in the system. So you take the test plan, and I've actually used the test plan to build training for the system. It's a great place to start. Uh, you look at things like the TAC memo or the con ops or whatever. All of this information has generally been built as part of creation of the system. And you just take it and cannibalize it and make it pretty and engaging, and then you can use it as training. Um, in concept exploration, we can look at other technologies, other methodologies. Again, is training the right thing? Maybe it's not. Maybe redesign the system is the right thing to do. Uh, then we can plan and prototype, develop and pilot, train and evaluate. It's a pretty, pretty standard process. Okay, this actually steps through uh, all of those things in detail. Is the other speaker here, Julie? OK, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of skip through these. I'll give you a second on each slide to, to look at it and talk about it. But I think you'd be very interested in what Julie has to say, too, what has to say. So critical needs, like I said, establishing the existing state, identifying the users of the system. Oh, didn't expect to do that fast. Uh, capability assessment, this is where I was talking about you know, what's already existing. Uh, courses of instructions, IE DOMs, things like that may have already been developed. Concept exploration, you know, what's the appropriate intervention? Uh, do a cognitive task analysis. This little guy is perfect for this. Uh, the concept of selection criteria. Yeah, <laughs> clearly, he's, he's not ballerina material. And a lot of times that happens in a system. I actually, uh, we were doing some research for a, a three-dimensional audio system that we were building, which is for sonar domain. So basically, the sonar operator puts on the headphones, and he gets his, his, um, his contacts in bearing space. So it sounds like, you know, if the guy is behind him, it sounds like he's behind him, so on and so forth. And uh, in doing research for this, I was looking at the sonar operator and what skills are required to be, a, or not skills, aptitudes really, are required to be a sonar operator. And I looked at the military ASVAB, which is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. And what, what high marks on the ASVAB are they looking for to recruit sonarmen or to put them into that field? 
and it didn't include spatial relations. And sonar is a very spatial domain. I mean, you have to really be able to look at a two-dimensional display and put it in three dimensions in your brain. But they didn't consider that part of the selection criteria. So again, as a human performance technologist, I would say, let's change the selection criteria. Maybe we don't have to train some things that we're training now. Uh, solution validation, developing prototypes, uh, training plans, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing a lot of blah, blah, blah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Solution implementation, which is uh, getting everything ready and then actually piloting the training program, the deployment of the program, uh, the evaluation, doing performance assessments, user, user satisfactions. Hello. There we go. And of course, lather, rinse, and repeat. So in summary, um, training and support also doesn't end at deployment. You know, sometimes people create training and they, they put the system out there and they train the users and they throw them out there and they haven't given them anything after that. There's no help guide. There's no, you know, there's, so you have to continue to support a system even if you're not training it. Um, the as we just talked about, it's a circular process. You analyze, you de design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And then you analyze what you just evaluated. And um, yeah, so it's the human performance technology um, domain is very valuable to the system as an engineer. You know, just because you got a hammer, which is training, doesn't mean that's what you got to use. Um, any questions, comments? No. We have a mic if you want one. Yeah. Okay. I want to come on Julie, want to come on. She's turn this So you mentioned something about um, mission and con ops. Um, yeah, the, I ran into a problem uh, about 11, 12 years ago, and you know, with two contractors, uh, two locations for one and uh, one for the other, they still didn't had, had no idea when they changed the whole architecture on the uh, from the E2C to E2D and the radar. They had no idea. And they didn't go to the real Navy operator carrier deck people. You know, they had to uh, radiate in a do not radiate in an unsafe direction. And with no dummy loads and uh, RF switches, they were still trying to figure that out two, uh, two years later in 06, you know, Nav Air. And what they should have done was go right to the um, operational people on carrier deck. You know, <laughs> And, you know, that was one of the big puzzles. Of course, you know, they, uh, they're producing about 72 of them on the, uh, for the, you know, E2Ds. You know, they went through, but it took a while. Uh, it's, it's fascinating sometimes to see what people don't do when they're developing a system. And, and the other part uh, is sometimes the expectation is kind of unrealistic. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now is developing apps for tablets. And people say, oh, we need an app to replace this form. So they give me the form and say, you know, build the app for that. Well, how do you use the form? How do you, you know, what's the context? What's the environment? What do you need to, you know, does this thing need to go underwater? Does it need to be, you know, in dark? Or does it, you know, and, and but, you see things like that all the time, you know. Oh, you can kind of figure out what it's supposed to do based on this little piece of information that we give you. And I imagine as systems engineers, you see that in the general system. But with respect to the user, there's often a lot of assumptions that get made. Yeah, I have a question about culture. You know, we run into that every day. And, uh, you know, we're not looking at, in our environment, we're not, uh, we don't have uh, end users. What we have is ourselves and our, uh, our people that work with us, 
and work against us, you know? <laughs> and so the question is, you sort of let that culture sort of slide, say it was difficult. Can you talk a little bit more about it? Culture change, the thing, that's, the thing with culture change, actually, I, I got a sort of an example here. I was talking about the 3D audio. We uh, did a lot of operational research, and we went up to NSNRL, which is the Naval Submarine Medical Research Lab in Groton, Connecticut, and we said, we want crews from your submarines to come in so we can talk to them, the sailors or the sonar guys. We want them to come in so we can talk to them. We want to show them this new technology and get their feedback. Well, we had uh, like the uh, NCOs, the upper enlisted guys come in and we said, here, put these on, you know, look at the screen, what do you think? And, you know, play around with it, turn your head, do whatever, play around with it. And they were like, oh, this is, this is not going to work. This is overwhelming. This is too much. You know, what if we get in a high contact density environment, which that's a valid concern. But, you know, and what if we do this? And then the guys are all going to break the headsets. These are $1,500 headsets. You know, I mean, they were just negative, negative, ne nothing good to say. We get the younger guys in there, and we put the headsets on them, and we turn it on, and they're like, whoa, this is awesome. Look at that. Can we make it so that I have my uh, display on a heads-up visor, and then when I turn in my chair, it actually changes my, you know, and they had everything to say about it. And what we realized was it was just a very generational thing. But trying to implement this technology without changing the culture of the older guys was going to be nearly impossible because they were so negative about it. So that was the big obstacle that we needed to overcome. And actually, the technology, I don't believe, is still implemented yet because there were so many hurdles to overcome. So. Uh, Culture change comes in many different forms, and a lot of times you hear, oh, we're not going to change it because we've always done it that way. Well, we all know what a great argument that is. <laughs> or, um, you know, it'll be too hard to change it. We don't want to change it. It'll be too hard. You know, there's a lot of things that go with culture change, and a lot of them are emotional things, not necessarily intellectual things. So you can change the culture. You just have to do it in a very careful way, and sometimes it takes a really long time. Speaking of time, I just wanted to let everyone know before we take our next question and remind you that when you wake up tomorrow morning, you will officially be further in the future than Marty McFly ever went. Because <laughs> as you know, today is Back to the Future Day. Yeah. So do we have any other questions for our next speaker starts? Yes, uh, just want an observation about this culture thing. I uh, had an experience uh, trying to get people to work on my roof and was smart enough to read the uh, OSHA rule that said over seven feet you need to be restrained. And I could not get a contractor to agree to have their people wear restraint on the roof. Now, if that isn't an example of uh, a cultural problem, I don't know what is. And what reasons did they give you for not doing it? Macho thing. Uh, they just don't see the need to be restrained and are willing to violate the law and, and violate their insurance coverage to live that image. That's, that's my interpretation anyway. Yeah, I mean, you could very well be right. It's, it's fascinating. And a lot of times you've been in culture, culture issues and you don't really realize it until you step back from it and you look at it. Are you ready? Awesome. That's okay. <laughs> I was just afraid I was going to have to start dancing and telling jokes and stuff. So I'm glad you showed up. Yeah, I still have about five minutes afterwards that I wanted to talk about the program itself. So we'll talk fast. Okay. I might, go so. oh, it's on. Yeah. might actually be better off without this thing because uh, I have the ability to project. They're okay. Doing so, okay. So let me just. Uh, Exactly, yeah. does, and that's uh, advanced and, pointer. Uh, yeah, laser. Okay, great. Okay, great. So I'm Dr. Julie Marble. I am here at uh, Johns Hopkins APL, and I got asked this afternoon if I could do this talk. So I know almost nothing about your group, and in fact, all I know is that the last two letters are systems engineering. So uh, forgive me if I tell you things that you already know. 
um, or assume things that you don't know. I have been with uh, APL for a whole whopping 10 months. I've been here since January. And I joke that I have a sordid history in human factors. My PhD is in cognitive psychology, human factors, but I also specialize in what's called human reliability analysis, which if you're not familiar with that, is the science of figuring out in complex critical systems when people are going to make really bad mistakes and this is something that you're required to do for nuclear power plants um, as part of the probabilistic risk assessment. Uh, I've also done some of that for the, uh, for the FAA. Um, and also when I was at the Outer National Lab, we did that for uh, NASA as well. Um, and in addition, I also have specialized in human-robot interaction or human autonomy interaction. And here at, a at, here at APL, I work in the asymmetric operation system, so I'm looking at cyber. To me, there's not a difference between autonomy and cyber systems. And what I'm going to be talking to you today about is a, is a project that Kathy Straub and I are going to be doing here at the lab on human vulnerability to phishing as a function of the interaction device. So uh, your smartphone versus your laptop versus your desktop. So just to show of hands this week, how many of you have been phished? How many of you have been phished more than once? How many of you think you have not been fished this week? This week? You think? OK. Are you sure? Yes. You're sure you have not been fished this week? <laughs> OK, how can you be sure? Uh, because I am suspicious. You're suspicious. You're suspicious of every e email. Well, one of the things we're going to be testing is whether or not that's true on every on every device that you have. So uh, we're going to be doing this work with Zhang Yang Li, Kai, Kai Chi Zhang, Anton Dabura, Nathan, and Nathan Boz here. And I have to uh, also say that this work is funded under National Science Foundation grant 1544493, eager. Uh, also, please forgive me if there's some weirdness of these slides. The last time I presented them, I was presenting them at the uh, first international conference on human factors and cybersecurity in Bulgaria. So there were a couple of things that I had to explain to people uh, that were culturally uh, focused. Okay. So one of the things that we find out, there's some, there's some work that, that has been done that found out that even after people have been trained, that they will still respond to phishing emails. So we were talking uh, in the last talk that training is really not the way to get people to use a system correctly. It's, it's, training is really the, the action of last resort. Your system should be built to support the human user. Otherwise, people forget their training. How many people have been in a training and you're a little bored and you pull out your phone and oh hey Facebook or you know whatever else happens to be more interesting? I have. I have. Have you? You never no, you'd never pull out your your uh, your phone and, and start doing something else. Or, you know, how many times have you been sitting in the back of the room and you look up at everybody and they've all got their computers sitting right there and they've got Washington Post stuff? I love the people who are doing the crossword because I'm sitting there doing it over their shoulder. OK, so even after training, one in five computer, uh, consumers still click phishing emails. And as far as phishing sites, so these are sites where you get redirected to a spoofed site. One in three people still can't discriminate phishing sites from legit sites. And they can be very, very hard to tell. For one thing, they'll put, um, they'll put the VeriSign ad up in the corner. What is the, ver what is the purpose of the VeriSign little, the VeriSign symbol on your, on your uh, market, on your shopping screen? Anybody know? It's a security sign. It's supposed to tell you, hey, this, uh, this site has been made safe. It's, it's guaranteed by VeriSign. Well, it's not just a little label. You can click that and you can see the certifications for that site. How many people knew that? Good. I'm glad you know. <laughs> One person. OK. Cybersecurity is, so why doesn't cybersecurity risk training work? Well, it's, it's perceived to be too labor intensive, OK? 
um, and it doesn't it doesn't really shift the folk risk model. When when you go online to go shopping, for example, most often you're you're doing two things. You're trying to save time. You don't have time to go out to the big box store or wherever, and you're looking for a good deal. Okay, and so you see a site, and well, it, it looks legit. Okay, and you think you know what it is that you should be looking for. You should be looking for the little lock sign. You should be looking for VeriSign. You should be looking to make sure that, okay, the, the it's using PayPal or, or whatever. <laughs> but you're in a hurry. And you've got stuff that you've got to do. And you've got to get, you know, you've got to get your Q32 space modulator and you've got to get it now. Okay. And after training, consumers may understand more about what some of the risks are, but they don't see themselves at risk because they're very suspicious about all the emails that they get. Okay, and similar things hold true for, you know, health literacy, okay, or health risk assessment training. Well, you know, 20% of white males over the age of 55 are at risk for a heart attack, but not me. Okay, um, you know, left, hand, left arm shoulder pain is a, is a sign of, of heart attack, but I've just been doing a lot of weight training lately. Okay. So CMU came up with a training course called Anti-Fishing Phil to teach people how to be more safe online. And they've, their studies found that user education can help prevent people from falling for phishing attacks. But the main problem was that it was really hard to get people to read the tutorials. Okay. I mean, how many people actually read the instructions? I almost never do, okay? Um, so, but anti-phishing fill is, is very useful for people who use it correctly. So if you're going to rely on training, effective training communicates risks. It amplifies your perception of risk. It lets you know what the, what's the base rate of something actually happening out there. Because if you already think that your probability of something happening is low, then you're not gonna take as many precautions, okay? And it also has to shift the effort and benefit ratio in favor of vigilance. You have to understand what the consequence of going to a spoofed phishing, a spoofed marketing site is, okay? So they get your debit card information. What kind of a big deal is that? Well, they can back route that and they can clean out your, your debit card bank account, but they might also be able to get exciting things like, oh, maybe you've entered your birth date into that website, okay? Or maybe you've entered your home address because you're getting the thing shipped to you. So all, all of this personal information, these are all assets, and we lose sight of what we've entered into these sites. We can only do this if we understand, and we can only create effective training if we understand how consumers evaluate and respond to risk in real time. So how many people remember, this is your brain? Nancy Reagan, thank you, I love Nancy Reagan and, and her, this is how we're gonna get people to, to stop uh, using drugs. So, this, so for those of you who don't remember, this was a set of ads when I was about, oh, I guess 11 years old this disembodied voice would show an egg. And the egg and the voice would say, this is your brain. And then it would crack the egg into a frying pan, it would fry up, and then the disembodied voice would say, this is your brain on drugs. And the interesting thing was that <laughs> these ads didn't work the way they were intended. They were, tr they were supposed to get people who had never used drugs, it was supposed to deter them from using drugs. And it, it didn't really work, okay? It didn't really have the deterrence on that group of people. Uh, it just sort of became a, a very funny icon. So now, you know, this is your brain, you know, this is your brain, this is your brain on the internet. Um, so here's your, this is your identity on the internet. The group that it did have a strong effect with, however, were people who were already hardcore drug users, because apparently the concept of frying your brain even more resonated really pretty well with these people. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to argue 
is that the people who develop the training and the people who develop the security protocols, that we really are the hardcore drug users okay, of, of the internet. And by that, what I mean is that when somebody who's really well informed about cybersecurity risks is given more training information as it is currently created, we get a, an amplification of what the risk is out there. But people who are just sort of the everyday users, they, they just see the funny Nancy Reagan ad. They don't get that amplification. It doesn't resonate with them. And so what we have to do is create training that actually resonates with the appropriate groups. So what are we doing? We're going to be create. We're going to be doing a study. It's always it's always fun to do studies with people, and there have been a number of studies done. Um, one of my personal favorites was uh, done uh, just about oh, probably six months after the Stuxnet virus was was uh, found in the wild. Um, does everybody here know how Stuxnet was transmitted? Raise your hand if you do know. Okay, Stuxnet. Stuxnet is a, is a worm, and it specifically attacks semen controllers on nuclear on plants that are used for processing nuclear materials. And it, the controllers um, are used to control the uh, centrifuges. Okay, what Stuxnet did was it got into computers. It went looking for Siemens controller software. And then while sending a signal that everything was normal, it made these centrifuges spin really, 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 really high and then shut down really fast. And then spin really, really, really high and shut down really fast. Now, if you imagine like pulsing a blender over and over and over again, you're gonna blow out your motor, right? And if you've blown out your motor, you're not gonna be able to process your nuclear material and therefore you're not gonna be able to build nuclear weapons. Another interesting thing about Stuxnet was that the worm itself, once it got onto a computer, it only traveled out to five, five or six more computers before it shut itself down and didn't, and didn't go any further. And that was to keep it from detecting. But the way it got on the computers, because it could only go to five computers, was it was left lying around on thumb drives in parking lots. Because you're walking around and you see, oh, somebody dropped their thumb drive. And you pick it up because you want to be a helpful person. We all want to help each other. And you stick it in your computer. And you can't tell that it's reading. And it goes, and it goes on. So getting back to the uh, study that I know about uh, was done at one of the national labs. And they just scattered thumb drives through the parking lots, and they had like a 75 hit rate, 75% hit rate at this national lab to see who would, and when you stuck it in your computer, you got this big splash screen that says, please show up for training. <laughs> okay, so, so it's always fun like that. Now, when I was in Bulgaria giving this talk, now this, this was, one, Bulgaria is a really strange place, okay, just for any number of re reasons, but, I was giving this talk, and we have the Minister of Energy in the room, and we have Major General Todor Dochev, and we have all of these, you know, people who are supposed to be experts in cybersecurity. Now, I'd been really paranoid at this talk, at this whole, this whole conference, you know, and if I had to use my, if I had to use my cell phone, I went across the street to the coffee shop <laughs> before I pulled it out. But while I was sitting there, I kept seeing these, you know, the major general stand up and pull his phone out of his pocket and he'd go off in the back corner and he would use his phone and it would be an iPhone or I'd see somebody else pull out their Blackberry and I'm sitting there and I'm just like, but, but, well, okay, but, well, okay, I'm not going to say anything until my talk. My personal favorite though was at the hotel, so we were all staying at the same hotel and the first night at the hotel, I looked to see what wireless routers there were, and there was the first one that was for the hotel. It said, Hotel Space Grand Space Sophia. Okay. The next day, when I came back from the conference, there was Hotel Space Grand Space Sophia. There was Hotel Underscore Grand Underscore Sophia. There was 
hotel hyphen grand hyphen Sophia hotspot, particularly like that one, um, and another one without the word hotspot. And I'm like, okay, there's at least three evil twins <laughs> for wireless routers here. I knew which one was supposed to be correct, and I had a completely wiped computer, so I did let myself watch Game of Thrones, but, <laughs> but even still. So what I'm telling you is that I'm in this room with people who are supposed to be the experts on cybersecurity, and they're making themselves vulnerable during a talk that has, at the very least, it has students in the room. And if you're at a conference on cybersecurity and there's students in the room, somebody's hacking something, <laughs> okay? So Kathy and I started wondering, well before this conference, does, do people's guard, does it drop as a function of, of their workload? Because we really know that if you increase somebody's workload, that they're likely to make mistakes. And one of the things that we know that happens with cybersecurity is you've got a job, a regular job that you've got to do. And all this cybersecurity stuff, if it gets in your way, well, we're a room full of reasonably smart people. We'll find a way around, <laughs> okay? So let's say you're on your way from, you know, one building to another on the Johns Hopkins campus and you've pulled out your, your work phone and you're checking your email as you're rushing across campus. Well, you're distracted, you're on a screen that's only this big, are you more likely to fall for a phishing email, even if you are normally a very secure person? So uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to create a faux phishing email, okay? And, and Johns Hopkins has done this before, We've they've been sent out, uh, and we're looking to, and we're going to be asking people to forward this is forward any email that they suspect to be phishing emails back to us. Okay, if they forward something, we'll be giving them a contextual survey. What cues in this did you see? Now, the last time I got the last best phishing email that I got was for a trip that I was going to be taking, and. I almost fell for it because it had the little link that says, click here to check your seats. And I'm kind of tall, so I'm kind of obsessive about getting the aisle seat. And I was about to click on the email because I did have a trip coming up. And just as I was about to click, I saw, oh my gosh, the dates, the dates are off. The dates are off by two days on either side. Oh my God, I'm not gonna be there at the right time. And I started to freak out because the person who, who, uh, who got my travel for me obviously made a mistake. And then I looked at the, the return address, and it didn't say U.S. Airways. It said U.S.A. number one Airways. I'm like, oh, I'm being fished. It was a beautiful thing. So what we're looking for are phishing cues like that. And sometimes people will say things that, that for cues, they'll say things like, well, there was spelling errors. Well, I put a lot of spelling errors in my emails when I just send them out. Or it came from a, a strange address. It came from, instead of, you know, Julie, Julie underscore marble at Johns Hopkins, or jhuapl.edu, it came from jhuapl.com. Okay, things like that. And we're also going to be asking them, where were you? What device were you looking at? Were you looking at this on your iPhone? Were you looking at this on a laptop? Were you working at home? at night, you know, sitting on your couch. And when they miss and when they miss a phishing email and they click on it, they follow up on it cuz we're going to be choosing some topics that people would follow up on. Oh, here, click here to see what your retirement account balance is or anything. They'll also get a contextual survey. Did you consider the risk? Okay? What was the context? And we might direct them to training. If we don't have to, I'm not sure. But this will be a longitudinal, this will be a long time, uh, study that will occur over a number of weeks, um, actually several months, and we're going to have a weighted longitudinal payment structure to encourage vigilance. So you get paid for every, for every correct rejection and for, well, not correct rejection, but for every phishing email you catch, you get paid because, you know, paying is good. Okay. And so what we'll be looking at is the environment, the device that they're on, what perceived pressures they have, um, the design of the email itself, 
And what are the trust factors? What are the things within emails that get people to fall for them? Okay. So one of our objectives is to create a cyber risk decision model. And the way you create a, a cognitive model like this is to look at systematic, is to create systematic behavioral studies where you look at the human user, you feed it into a model of decision making. There's actually a number of models of decision making. Many of them are rule based. We are discussing using ACTAR for this one because that one is, is very much an if this, then this kind of, of model. It's not my favorite, but it works. But they also take into account things like perception and motor control. Because sometimes you just click on something and you didn't mean to. And maybe that's an issue with teeny tiny little computer devices that are only this big. But we'll create a computational model of cyber risk decision making that's informed by these behavioral studies. And we want to identify the behavioral predictors, user characteristics, and, and characteristics of the computer, the computing environment that predispose people to making errors. Because nobody, nobody says, well, I'm going to just make a huge cyber error today, and I'm going to open up my entire network to, to a, major, you know, a major worm. But you know, we all do things that, well, if we'd been aware of the consequences, we probably wouldn't have done it. OK. And the benefits that we see is that we're going to get an understanding of the factors that, just, that drive consumer and employee cyber security decisions. We really ultimately want to end up with a predictive decision-making model. And use all of that to come up with training that's tuned to consumer, consumers' folk understanding of, of cybersecurity so that, so that I won't be creating training that will work for someone like me who's already informed. But really, honestly, I want to create training that's going to help my mom. Okay, because I do get calls from my mom saying, uh, the computer has all gone blue, what do I do now? <laughs> okay, so that's where we are. And uh, probably I'll come back at some point in time and tell you how we did. So, yeah, I can take questions. Gentleman in the white shirt. So the result of your survey uh, is going to be published. And the fishers will do better now. That is always a that is always a possibility. Yes, you're all you are correct. However, they uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, um, they're already modeling you. I would argue that hackers, they already have a pretty good idea of those things, and we're we're behind the times on on what they're doing. So, is it better to just sit there in the dark, or is it better to light a candle? And if we have a better understanding of what to teach people to look for, then they have to work harder. So yeah, you're right. So it's a it's a continuous game. Yes. You know, and and I think that's true in any security situation. Yes. Yes, yes it is. Um, yes, it is. And I could give you a better answer, but I but well, let's think about it this way. If I make the holes smaller and smaller, then you have to get better and better. And no matter what, that just means that there's going to be fewer worms attacks that are out there. So yeah, everybody gets better, but it becomes fewer. Yeah. Wonderful talk, Julie. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a question about tackling this problem, which is a very multi-dimensional problem, you know, what will you think will be the big surprises? I mean, People often are on their computers at odd hours of the night when they're fatigued, when their perceptual system one uh, is okay, but system two is basically done for the day. Yep. Um, I suspect that that's going to be a major driver in your study. What do you think will be the big surprises that this will reveal? Actually, I did something similar one time, a similar type of study where we were looking at um, maintenance-based uh, Maintenance-based causes of aviation accidents. Okay, so we're talking about exciting things like forgetting to detach the blue water truck from the plane before you drive away, or driving the luggage truck under the wing, 
also kind of a bad thing to do. And we went looking through all of these events and incidents, and the thing that struck, that struck us the most was when the accidents occurred. They did not occur in, on dark and stormy nights at midnight on the tarmac when somebody had pulled a double shift. They were occurring mostly for this one airline on sunny blue sky days. And that was, that's the kind of surprise that I'm expecting to see, that, that we will find the equivalent of that people are most likely to make mistakes when they are most relaxed. That's the kind of surprise that, that would not surprise me because I've seen it before. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, people make, it, we all know that people make errors when their workload is high, when they're stressed out, but maybe people are more vigilant on their iPhones and they don't, or maybe it's just that they don't respond to email on their iPhones because the screens are too small. And so they end up responding to phishing email when they're on their laptops because they're more relaxed and they're not paying attention. I don't know, but you asked me what things, what surprises I might see. There's one that would be a not so surprising surprise. The question. Yeah. Uh, what false alarm, what do you, uh, are you measuring false alarms? Yes, we will measure false alarms. So if they forward emails that are not phishing emails, one of the things we'll be asking is, you know, why did you think this was a, why did you think this was a phishing email? And that itself will provide us a fair amount of information. It'll also give us an indicator simply of how vigilant people are being because you can get a me you can get a measure of that as well so so just basic signal detection theory do you expect the uh, the fact that they're in the study to increase their false alarm rate? yes at first but since we'll be doing this for a significant period of time hopefully that halo effect will will wash away um, lessons learned which is a almost hallowed uh, concept in the system engineering community. Uh, if you are serious about, you know, mm -hmm. taking care and you find examples of phishing and you confirm that they're most likely that, uh, there doesn't seem to be a very good mechanism to share that knowledge. And so you can have all these general uh, briefings and so on, but unless you have hard data yep. to share with the conscientious students, I really don't see we're going to make any progress. You know, that's an excellent comment, and I'm glad that you went down that route, because the reason that I gave this talk in Bulgaria is that I'm part of, um, so NATO has a collaborative science office uh, through the science and technology office, and they run, they have uh, seven different uh, topical areas, and I'm a member of the Human Factors in Medicine 259 group, which is Human Factors of Cybersecurity. And in addition to just creating a general report on, you know, what are the causes of, of human errors in cybersecurity, one of the things that we hope to be doing is to create a tool that will allow people who are developing systems to actually search through and say, okay, well, I'm building, I'm building training to uh, reduce errors in cybersecurity. What are the considerations? I'm building a tool to help people identify phishing attacks. What's the research and considerations? That panel, or sorry, that group uh, just had its first meeting in Bulgaria, so we're still identifying, you know, what's the best form for this tool, but that's, that's ultimately our goal, and because there is not a good way to share that information. In other areas, um, in nuclear power, you have licensee event reports. In aviation, you have, I forget what they call them, but they have a similar incident reporting, the Aviation Incident Reporting System, I think it is. So yeah, so they have all of, they all have those, but we don't really have a, we, and there are, there are things for like spreading, you know, spreading information about worms and viruses, but not so much the people end of things. So that's our, actually our goal. Yes, sir. Uh, things you know as far as examples go or uh, maybe a few one of the biggest bandwidth wasters and they should not get any more spectrum is Verizon uh, particularly because if you see uh, 
on your homepage or you know your Outlook Express or whatever, you see a brand name, and then you um, look at the uh, domain. Yeah, you know, no, it's not a return address. It's something crazy or any stupid text underneath. Mm -hmm. And um, also, you know, if you click on uh, properties, as an example, you can see message source and so on. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't deserve bandwidth for their uh, cellular system. They're one of the worst, you know, compared, you know, Gmail is very good. The other thing um, is, what about designing software for the email? I know that there is some uh, for um, Internet Explorer, the older one, or if you mm -hmm. have something, you can say it's spam or phishing. Norton's pretty good, but to try to intercept it. Verizon doesn't want to intercept stupid things because they want people to use uh, up their gigabytes. So, you know, there should be, uh, you know, software that's uh, designed to stop this. Yeah, and you're, you're correct. There are, there are actually spam filters that are out there that, that do a, a pretty good job, but there's always those emails that have been crafted well enough and the domain name from where they're coming, they, they look good enough. And the other problem with some spam filters is that they will pull things from domains that are legit that you actually want to get and then you have to go looking in your in your junk folder. Um, one of the fun things too that hackers and, and spoofers are doing is they will actually take the the VeriSign ad or they'll take um, they'll they'll spoof um, an ad that they've figured out that you're interested in. Um, in one case I know uh, it was an ad for deck polish uh, and they'll they'll just you know create a bad domain um, that looks looks legit, the ad looks legit. And they're just, you know, they're stealing the, the, they're stealing the images off of the legit domains. Yes, sir. So <clears throat> I can go a little bit further on some sophistication. So the Navy Federal Credit Union has been hacked. I get emails on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. I don't have an account with them. So it's very easy for me to find those. Yes. I report them all back to the Navy Federal Credit Union, but I look at the domain. It is correct. It's at their help desk. Everything else is in there. They tend to fix the hole for a month maybe or the most, and then again, I'm getting it again. So I, I actually get a lot from Navy Federal and from USAA. I'm not a member of either one, but because of my profile, I am assume that I am part of that. But when you look at how much public information is available, such as you buy a new car, you mm -hmm. bought a house, mm -hmm. you are so susceptible to anything that if you're targeted, I, I don't think you can find it. And and I and that's my challenge. That I think that you could craft something. You bought a brand new GM car. Hey, thank you for buying your GM car for appreciation. Click this link and tell us fill out this little survey. Or someplace like Encosi might send out a survey and say, click this link and fill out this survey. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is the problem with the world that we live in. And from my perspective, from security engineering, we have to kind of help protect the individuals that don't know this stuff. And that's why I think the act of cyber defense is a starting point. It's, it's very much in its infancy, but still that once you've identified this email is, is, uh, is not valid, then you can block it through everything and you can block it through company, government wide, however you want to do it. And if it's finally good enough that Symantec and, and the McAfee people will start blocking it stuff, these things could actually be eradicated fairly easy. Mm -hmm. And and you're correct. And and the example that you gave has actually been around for a number of years. They get uh, they get addresses off of of different websites. People pay obscene amounts of money for uh, what are called virgin virgin names, virgin lists. Um, and it's really kind of surprising uh, where where they get them from. Um, but that that idea has been around for a number of years. But then what happens is because email is so easy, it's really easy to generate these emails. And as the gentleman in the white shirt said, uh, they just create a new a new link. And so it, it does get it does get interesting. Um, but like I said, what I'm what my goal is is to make something that's simple enough for my mom, who's you know 75 years old, to to use so that I have a f a few fewer calls about you know blue screen of death or or whatever. And just on the other end of things, um, I personally have had my personal, my PII uh, hacked at least uh, 
I think I'm up to five times this year because I got hit with the OPM attacks. Um, I got hit when the NRC got uh, got uh, hacked, and then three other places got hacked. So I'm sort of like, well, I'm on every list that there is now. Um, but the other part of that, too, is, is simply that it's good to have network systems as that first line of defense, but nothing is foolproof to a sufficiently talented fool. And, and so we have, to, we have to have the ability for people to, to identify when they're at risk and have a good understanding of what that risk is. There are no other questions. I think it's time to uh, express our appreciation and then have a drawing for the, for the book prize. Am I on? Yes. Oh, I, I was going to go through some slides real quick on the, the JHU systems engineering, human systems engineering concepts that are on that chair right there as you go out the door if you want to grab one of those. If you have any questions about the program, feel free to give me a call, uh, and I can talk to you about it. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for sticking with us tonight. <laughs> Appreciate it. Now, who needs a ticket? Anybody? No? I'm just pretend coverage.
Is it under here? Uh, my channel, I guess. Yes. Um, it says live now. We, we went, uh, let's make sure we're off. Uh, I thought I was stop sharing. I, that's not that's not running. Is that one? What is that? Where are we running if we're live? That one. Stop sharing. How do we get it out? First of all, let's do that. Stop broadcasting.